live everywhere. Yes, we are. Welcome everyone to this week's caregiver question of the week. This week I have a really good question that came in. It is about a um, very specific kind of phenomena that often comes up when people are late to end stages of dementia. It's called peritonia. It's not well researched, it's not well discussed, but it does happen a lot and it has actually a big impact on um, quality of life and can be a huge frustration for caregivers. So we're gonna be talking about that today on caregiver question of the week. Uh, real quick, I did wanna let everyone know that the second event in the Family Caregiver Fall Prevention Series is coming up next Tuesday. That's gonna be at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. And I'm super excited. Shay Domain is gonna be co-hosting with me for that event. Um, Shay is an absolutely amazing, fantastic physician assistant. And we are going to be talking about how you actually advocate for fall prevention services and fall prevention intervention in our healthcare system. So we're going to be talking about like words and phrases that you can use to actually um, help advocate for someone or maybe even advocate for yourself to get fall prevention intervention. We are going to be talking about um, who in the healthcare team should all be involved because a lot of times we don't get all of the players involved that need to be to really truly have good, comprehensive, effective fall prevention. And the third thing we're gonna be talking about are community resources that you need to be aware of in order to best advocate for fall prevention and to go out there and get and use those resources um, to help someone that you're caring for, maybe someone that you love, again, maybe even yourself if it's something that you're worried about, um, get early fall prevention intervention because that's when it works best. Um, anyway, though, let's get to the caregiver question of the week. My name is Amelia, I'm an occupational therapist, and this is for education purposes only. So if anything I, that I say reminds you of someone that you think needs intervention from a licensed healthcare provider, then please make sure you are reaching out to said licensed healthcare provider for that person or maybe even for yourself if that's what you need, as this is not a substitute for health and medical advice and it is not a substitute for a therapeutic relationship. Okay, so let's talk about peritonia. Um, peritonia is this sort of really kind of specific tonal uh, phenomena, and I don't mean tonal in terms of like what you're hearing, I mean tone in terms of muscle tone that is that is within someone's body. There are lots of different kinds of issues related to hypertonia, um, meaning someone has too much muscle tone. And then there are also issues that people can have related to hypotonia, meaning someone doesn't have enough muscle tone and maybe that limb is kind of floppy or, or flaccid. Um, peritonia it is a really kind of different form of, of the phenomena that people are more familiar with. So probably when you think of hypertonia, you're think of, thinking of things that are like rigidity, which often has to do with Parkinson's disease, where, where someone kind of gets stuck, um, or maybe even spasticity, which is very commonly found in folks who have strokes, for example. And that's a that's a kind of tone that's, um, anyway, well, we can talk about spasticity another time. Let's, I, I, I digress. Let's talk about peritonia and how first it affects function um, in folks who have very late stage or end stage dementia. And then why it's so important that it be dealt with as, as best as it can be. So, so what is peritonia? Like I said, it's a kind of very specific kind of tone where someone will be resistive to passive movement. And, and more than just like it's hard to move them, it actually feels like the person is actively resisting you while you're trying to move them. So the way that I will often describe it, um, if I get called in to do an evaluation with someone who has peritonia, um, it is, it's almost like, let's say you were sitting and someone came up and they grabbed your hand and you weren't expecting it. You didn't know that someone was there. You didn't know they were coming at you and someone grabbed, grabbed your hand for some reason and you would just, 
your reflex would be to pull back, right? That's almost what peritonea feels like um, when you're trying to move or care for someone who has peritonea, because rather than it just being like them, they're rigid and they're hard to move, um, uh, or they just have like too much muscle tone in that, in that hand or in that muscle all the time, it really feels like it feels like they're actively resisting you moving them. And this can be really problematic for a few different reasons. One is because it makes it a lot harder to care for someone if, if they're actively resisting you, right? Um, the most common reason why people, why, why I've been called in to do evaluations for things like peritonia is because it often presents itself um, most obviously, it can happen all over the body, but it often presents itself most obviously in the hand. And so you might have someone who is really quite dependent. Um, they might not be able to verbalize their needs anymore. Um, uh, they might not be able to really move their own body anymore. And their hand, uh, again, this happens, this tends to happen in in late stage to end stage dementia. And the hand will be really, really tight. Um, and so that creates some risk factors, some problems, right? If the hand is really tight and you can't get someone to open their hand, if you can't open their hand because they're resisting that, um, and I should say it is involuntary. The person is not trying to resist to be difficult. It's it's not something that is a behavioral issue or someone, you know, like I said, trying to be difficult. It is an involuntary level of resistance. Um, but if you can't get that hand open, then the hand is at risk of a bunch of different things. One, like you can't clean in there, right? And we do need to be able to clean in there because if we can't clean in there, then the skin can start to get kind of wet um, uh, it can start to break down and they can have a risk of wounds. Another risk is when the, when, when the hand is closed and those nails are in there and we can't clip the nails and the nails are digging into the palm, the nails themselves can cause wounds. Um, and of course, when someone's hand is closed or any part of their body is sort of stuck in a position, then we have a risk of contractures developing and contractures are when the, um, the, the joint itself or the connective tissue um, around that joint or even, even the muscles and tendons themselves get shorter, they get tighter, and they make it so the joint can no longer move in a full range of motion. And that's problematic, again, because it increases the issues with, with providing hygiene in the hand, with cleaning in the hand, um, with uh, making sure there's no wounds forming in the hand. And it also can be quite painful to develop those kinds of contractures. So it's something that we want to do something about. Um, so here's where my answer is going to get a little bit more nuanced and complicated for like, what do we, what do we do about this? And I will say it is a really common concern that caregivers have when they're caring for people and end in late stage dementia about how do we get this hand open? What do we do? Um, uh, you know, this person seems to be fighting me or resisting me or whatever it is. And, and, you know, funky things are going on in here. Um, so I'll, I'll give a couple of general tips, but what I really also want to say is this is absolutely something where an occupational therapist truly does need to be called in to do an evaluation. Um, it is something that occupational therapists can be called in to do an evaluation for all of the reasons that I just talked about. So it, it, it has to do with ADLs, it has to do with hygiene, it has to do with prevention of wounds, it has to do with prevention of contractures, it has to do with prevention of pain. And all of those are good reasons why an occupational therapist can get orders, can be called in to do an evaluation and provide treatment for this kind of issue. Um, and, and so I wanna lead off with with that. And I know it's not always like, it's a frustrating thing to hear that, well, you have to have someone come and provide individual treatment about this, but that's the responsible thing for me to say it. And it is true because this isn't something that you're going to want to um, deal with independently, make all the decisions about independently for a couple of reasons that I will enumerate here coming up. Um, so one of them is that we can actually cause damage 
to the hand when we are trying to manage a hand with peritonia if it's not managed correctly. Um, one of the one of the tips that I would share is like when if you're opening a hand that has peritonia, moving really slowly, moving really gently, and not forcing anything is extremely important here. Um, if you try to force open a hand that that is actively resisting you, if you try to force any part of the body that's actively resisting you, there's a good chance that damage is going to be caused to that part of the body. And the hand is particularly vulnerable to this because it, it's very complex. The, um, a lot of the things, it, a lot of the structures of the hand are delicate. They can be easily damaged. And so unfortunately, a lot of the times, by the time I get called in, someone already has a hand injury, which really makes um, dealing with the peritonia much more difficult, much more painful. Um, just, you know, a, a, and a less effective process in general. So we never want to force open these hands. Um, we want to move slowly, gently. If, you know, if we get a finger open part of the way and then all of a sudden it locks back down, we're just going to go back down with the finger. We're not going to actively um, try to force anything open. Um, that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, one of the things what people will often try to do is, you know, try to get like a, a washcloth inside the hand, a rolled washcloth, and that can be a good starting point um, to help provide some, oh, some space um, and keep things drier and cleaner in the hand. But again, really, it is super important to call in an occupational therapist to help with this issue. And here are some more of the reasons. One, we don't want that hand to become damaged. And it was really, really helpful to have someone there one-on-one -on -one with you providing actual training for the person that you are caring for, for that individual to safely get that hand open. Two, sometimes there are specific splints or orthotics for the hand that, um, that the occupational therapist is going to recommend. And you do want a specific individualized recommendation for that. Uh, this is not something that I recommend you go on Amazon or, um, you know, any like um, splinting or, or DME website and you try to order a splint that you think will work for someone's hand um, who, who is having peritonia. You really need an individualized recommendation because Again, if it's not the right splint, it can cause significant damage. Um, there's risk of skin breakdown. There's, there's risk of other issues. So you really do need a licensed professional who is guiding you in this journey in order to help make sure that you are able to um, manage a hand uh, or other parts of the body that have peritonia as well in ways that are um, not frustrating for you as a caregiver and ways that are going to be safe and um, hopefully as painless as possible for the person who has dementia. Um, okay, that was kind of a long caregiver question of the week. Sorry for the length of that, but peritonia is a, a like I said, this is incredibly common to see in people who have very late to end stage dementia. It's something that I have seen in my own practice so many times. Um, uh, and it's something that, again, I want I want you all to realize that it is something that you you can absolutely advocate for calling in a, a licensed provider, calling in an occupational therapist to come in and, and help you um, find ways to manage this issue because it's really, really can have a big effect on quality of life for the person that is being cared for. And it certainly affects the level of frustration for the caregiver who is trying their hardest to provide that care. Um, okay, so that's it for this week's caregiver question of the week. If you have a question, please make sure you can post it in the comments wherever you're watching this. Please make sure to tag me so that I see your question. If you want to submit it, um, if you want to submit it anonymously, then you can use the link to go ahead and submit your question that way. I will drop a link to submit your question um, privately in that way in the comments section below. And then also, if you are someone who is concerned about falls, about maybe the person that you're caring for falling, then definitely check out next week's event with 
uh, myself and Shay Domain talking about um, how we advocate effectively for fall, fall prevention with our healthcare providers. Um, that's going to be next Tuesday at nine. And I hope to see you there if it is something that would be beneficial to you. And otherwise, I will see you next week for next week's caregiver question of the week. I'll see you then. Bye. Take care.